This episode of Food for Thought is brought to you by the listeners of this podcast, and that means you. Thank you for valuing this podcast by supporting it at patreon.com slash Colleen Patrick Goudreau. Thank you especially to Liz D., a longtime supporter who just upgraded her support to be a hero. Thank you so much, Liz. And thank you, as always, to benefactors David Cabrera and Alexander Gray, Angels, Brooke Boussard, Michal Stone, Gina Stryler, and Carrie Parker. Thank you to my heroes, Simon Small, Angelica Lofton, Jennifer Statmiller, Jennifer Watkins, Gerilyn Hilmar, PJ Schuster, Denise Hoskins, Rangini Mohan, Tina Strassheim, and now Liz D. Thank you to everyone who listens to and subscribes to and supports this podcast, making it available and valuable for everyone who listens. Visit patreon.com slash Colleen Patrick Goudreau to be one of them. Welcome to Food for Thought Podcast. My name is Colleen Patrick Goudreau. I am your host. Today's topic is the principles of compassion. Hi, everyone. I hope you're doing fabulously well. This episode is a rebroadcast of one we did a few years ago, but I think the topic of compassion never gets old, never gets dated. The content itself was featured in one of my Compassion in Action conferences. I may mention it below or in this episode. And you can also find a lot of this content in my latest book, The Joyful Vegan, How to Stay Vegan in a World that Wants You to Eat Meat, Dairy, and Eggs. Signed copies are available at joyfulvegan.com as are gift cards as the holidays are approaching. I'm leaving for Africa next week and will be gone for one month, but I've recorded and scheduled a number of new podcast episodes for you for while I'm gone. And if you'd like to follow along on our trips, we'll be in Rwanda and South Africa on the garden route. We'll be in Botswana. We'll be in Cape Town. The best place to do so is on Instagram. So follow me over there if you are not already. And finally, Northern Italy is about to be considered sold out. This is Northern Italy 2023. Tuscany still has a few spots left. This is in June of 2023. So I hope you can join us in Italy next year. If you're more interested in France, we have two trips live on the website also in 2023. And I urge you to take advantage of the early bird prices for both the French countryside trip in September and the Alsace Christmas trip in December. The early bird price is up there for a little longer. And I think you'll want to take advantage of that. Everything is at joyfulvegantrips.com. In the meantime, I hope you enjoy this episode. Now, today's topic is borrowed from some of the content I'm working on for our Compassion Weekend. And I'm going to share a little bit of that with you today to tantalize you, yes, but really because this topic is so foundational to my work and to this podcast, and of course, so important in terms of what we all care about and why you're even listening today. The impetus for the Compassion Immersion Weekend Retreat, as you know, was to celebrate the 10-year anniversary of this podcast. I wanted to celebrate with you, but I also wanted the celebration to be meaningful and valuable, something you'd be able to sink your teeth into and remember for the rest of your life, something that wasn't about me or you, but about the reason we're all connected in the first place. I put this event together because I've heard from thousands of people over the last almost two decades I've been doing this work who are heartsick over what happens to animals, who are heartsick about the violence and cruelty in our world, and who are doing something about it by becoming vegan, but who struggle to maintain joy in the awareness of suffering, who struggle to have compassion for people participating in that suffering, who struggle to find their own voice and be a voice for animals, who struggle to communicate their values in a world that can be critical and defensive, who struggle to figure out how they can contribute to a compassionate world beyond being vegan, who struggle being outside of the status quo, whether in their families or at school or at work or in their communities. Does any of that sound familiar to you or something with which you can identify? 
we step into our full compassion by becoming vegan, but we feel weighed down by it as much as we feel uplifted by it. And of course, I've been talking about these phenomena for as long as I've been doing this work, for longer than you've been listening to this podcast, and of course, in the 10 stages of what happens when we stop eating animals. But it occurred to me that after all this time, I didn't have a specific episode on exactly what compassion is. Obviously, you can glean from the various episodes what I think it is, and you can certainly glean what it is based on your own experience and intuition. But as I create the content for my Compassion Immersion Retreat that I hope you're joining me at, I have spent a lot of time thinking, well, what is compassion? And what is this universal principle that I believe we're all born with? What is this thing that compels us to do the right thing and act on our ethics, stop eating animals, stop eating their secretions, stop contributing to violence against animals and and anyone who's suffering? What are the principles of this thing that drives so many of us to do the right thing? Now, compassion differs from sympathy and empathy in that while they are about feeling sorry for someone and even taking on someone's pain and suffering, compassion is characterized by wanting to end that suffering. Compassion is action-oriented. Now, of course, compassion is the foundation of everything I do personally and professionally. Compassion is what drives me. Compassion is still the official name of my company that I chose when I started teaching cooking classes mm, almost 18 years ago. Compassionate Cooks is still my LLC. Compassionate Cooks LLC. Compassion is why I do this work. It's why you're all listening now. And of course, it's why I'm vegan. Because being vegan is the door through which I walk to reach my goal of unconditional compassion. You've heard me say this before, and I will say it again. Compassion is the goal. Veganism is the way to get there. The goal is not to become vegan. Being vegan isn't a milestone to reach or a club to join or a badge to wear. For me, the goal is to live with integrity, to manifest my values in my behavior, and to do everything I can to not intentionally cause harm to myself or anyone else. And being vegan, living fully awake and fully compassionately is the most practical way to do that. In other words, I became vegan is just a succinct way of saying I removed the blocks to the compassion that had been inside of me all along. Now, I don't know about you, but I didn't look at this thing called vegan and say, now that's a club I want to join. It's going to cause disharmony in my family. It's going to separate me from the status quo and make me feel like an outsider at times. It's going to make me the butt of predictable jokes. It's going to make me the target of passive aggressive quips. It's going to limit my purchasing options and compel me to become an expert in nutrition, history, philosophy, world religions, anthropology, animal husbandry, ecology, and the culinary arts, but whatever, sign me up. Rather, there was a pivotal moment in which I realized that my actions were not in alignment with my values, that I was so uncomfortable with violence being perpetuated on my behalf that my response, the response that naturally followed, was to stop participating in those behaviors, i.e. reflect my ethics in my actions, i.e. remove the blocks to the compassion that had compelled me to participate in habits that were anathema to the very things I care about, i.e. become vegan. I often talk about the process of becoming vegan as a process of becoming awake, specifically awake to the unconditional compassion we experienced as children before people taught us to believe that unconditional compassion is sentimental, that there's no room for it in this dog-eat-dog world, that it's for suckers, that it's for sissies. Tradition, social norms, family pressure, advertising campaigns, government subsidies, and marketing messages masked as public service announcements, all lead us to successfully squelch our once fierce, once unconditional compassion, put it to sleep and suppress it. It's so sad, but it's true. We're all taught to compartmentalize our compassion and reserve it 
only for those who are in a particular group, mostly for those who look like us, mostly for those who live like us, who believe like us, who behave like us, who sound like us, doling it out as one would limited, scarce rations, as if exercising it fully and authentically would deplete us of it. And so we actually learn to ration it, to ration our compassion. And we all do it. Even we vegans do it. We all decide who is worthy of our compassion and who it should be withheld from, who deserves it and who should be denied this compassion based on who they are or what they do or what they've done. And so we make it conditional, keeping it suppressed and compartmentalized and pulling it out when it's convenient. And we wonder why the world is in the state it's in. Perhaps you've heard me say before that the problems we have in this world are not because we have so much compassion we don't know what to do with it. The problems we have in this world are because we are not living according to the values of kindness and compassion we say we have. The problem isn't that we wake up in the morning wanting to contribute to violence or cruelty. The problem is that we don't wake up in the morning wanting to create more compassion, more peace, more nonviolence. If that were on our to-do list every day, imagine what our world would be like. Imagine for a moment what we could accomplish. Was that on your to-do list today? Now, being vegan means that there's a greater chance that throughout the day, I'm going to be able to manifest my values of compassion and kindness because I'm not participating in egregious acts of cruelty, i.e. animal violence and exploitation several times a day. I'm not paying for someone to hurt and kill animals on my behalf. Indirect though it is, paying for someone else to hurt and kill is as close as you can get to doing it yourself. So being vegan means I've stopped participating in what is pretty egregious violence. Being vegan means I'm manifesting my behavior in my values, but it doesn't mean I get a pass. It doesn't mean we get an integrity pass just because we've become vegan. It's an amazing and beautiful, albeit sometimes painful way to live, but make no mistake about it. Even as vegans, we remain human. And I don't know about you, but I'm not looking to win a prize or wear a medal. I want this feeling I have, this desire to not create harm, this deep empathy I feel to be felt by everyone. I don't want to be in an exclusive club of a few people who I deem good and everyone else bad. I don't want to live in self-righteousness, smugly congratulating myself and pointing the finger at anyone else who's not living the way I am. Being vegan doesn't make me better than anyone else. It just makes me better than who I was. And I want everyone to rise to their highest selves. That's the goal, isn't it? To act from our highest self, the highest that's in us. I know that feels pretty good when I do that. And I want that for everyone. Imagine if we all walked around manifesting our deepest values in our daily choices. Being vegan is a practical way to do this because you become awake and accountable, but it's en route to something else, to our deepest, most unconditional compassion, to authentic compassion, not rationed compassion. And so what does it mean to live according to compassion? What does it mean on a practical level? I don't live according to vegan. See how silly that sounds, right? I live, I want to live according to compassion. It's one thing to create some new habits and learn about some new products and et cetera. But my goal is to live according to compassion. So what are the principles of compassion? What are the practical aspects of living a compassionate life without complacency? How do we navigate these principles in a world that seems to ignore them? And that means that requires work on our part as well. Now, I read a fair amount on this topic. I do a fair amount of research for my own workshops and podcasts and books. And I'm pretty excited about the principles of compassion that I've conjured. I really imagine that there are more than 10 or maybe there's nine, maybe there's 16. I have this perfect list of 10 right now, but this is where I'm starting. So there. Uh, So I have the 10 principles of compassion I've come up with, and I really haven't seen this in a lot of other places. And I'm really excited about it because I think it articulates at least it's a start of what it means to live compassionately in a practical way. Elements of what I'm sharing with you are part of a session in our Compassion Immersion Retreat 
called the principles of compassion. But of course, I'm going to be elaborating on these in great detail at the event. I'm going to be doing exercises with everybody. So again, join us at the event because it's going to be pretty special. And I'm just giving you a little bit of it here. And here we go. The 10 principles of compassion. Number one, compassion is unconditional. You may have heard me talk about this idea in the podcast episode, which is most likely one of the top three podcast episodes of mine, which is how to talk to a hunter or anyone else with whom you disagree. So compassion is unconditional. Compassion isn't compassion unless it's given to everyone, the guilty and the non-guilty, the kind and the unkind, the compassionate and the uncompassionate, the good and the evil. In other words, if I'm only compassionate to those who agree with me or who live the same way I do or who've never erred, that's not authentic compassion. Being compassionate to those who are compassionate to me or who agree with me is easy. Authentic compassion is showing compassion for those who are unlike me or who disagree with me. I think one of the biggest misconceptions about this idea that compassion is unconditional is when we think that if you're compassionate to people who do bad things, you're condoning that bad behavior or that you have to keep toxic people in your life because you want to be compassionate. But that's not understanding what compassion is. That's not compassion. (laughs) Practicing compassion doesn't mean you're a martyr or a doormat. It doesn't mean you accept unethical or illegal behavior. Practicing compassion means creating appropriate boundaries. The question we have to ask ourselves when we think, well, I'm not going to have compassion for fill in the blank slaughterhouse workers, people who hurt animals, people who hurt people, hunters, is how does me not having compassion for them serve me? How does it serve them? How does it serve the world? What does it look like to not have compassion for them? And what does it look like to have compassion for them? And those are questions that I would pose to you. Number two, Compassion includes the self. Compassion that doesn't include the self is inauthentic and could also potentially turn us into martyrs or worse yet, people who just disregard our own welfare and happiness. You can't make decisions that help others if they hurt you. That should be one of the main criterion when asking if you should do something or help someone, right? The question we need to ask is, will I be put into harm's way if I make this decision? What's at risk? My home, my job, my physical, financial, emotional security, right? Those are questions that we need to ask. But self-compassion isn't just about avoiding harm to help others. Obviously, an element of sacrifice isn't awful or always unavoidable, right? People demonstrate compassion in heroic ways, and it's not logical or real realistic or even necessary that we should never do anything to help someone else if it involves risk or sacrifice, right? But outside of the large things that risk demonstrating self-compassion, we also need to be mindful of the regular, ongoing, sustainable elements of self-compassion, doing things each day that take care of ourselves, eating well, being outside, exercising, having a social life, finding quiet time, being self-aware, practicing compassion, whatever it is. And it's funny because compassion says we should treat others the way we would want to be treated, but we don't often treat ourselves the way we treat others, right? So it's interesting. So self-compassion is treating ourselves the way we treat our loved ones, right? And there are so many things we do and say to ourselves that we would never do or say to the people we care about that's not compassion. And just to link back to number one, there are also things we would never do or say or think about people we care about that we do and say and think about people we don't agree with, or even if we don't like, that's also not compassion. And so I would ask you to ask yourself, what are some ways you can demonstrate more self-compassion in your everyday life? Number three, compassion includes language and speech. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can break my heart. Anyone who's ever said the alternative to that, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me, was probably saying that through tears as a way to convince themselves to get over what seemed trivial to them. But yes, it's true. Cruel words can't make you bleed or blister, but they can absolutely hurt and scar. And on the flip side, kind words can bring you joy and healing. 
Many of you know I spend a great deal of time talking about our use of language and words when it comes to animals and veganism. There's so much to say. And of course, I've talked about this in many different podcast episodes, and I will be doing so at the event as well. But there's a principle I'm really attracted to, and I just want to share it with you. Perhaps some of you are familiar with it. It really resonates with me. It's tied into compassionate language, and it's the idea of right speech, which is one of the elements of what's called the Noble Eightfold Path in Buddhism. And here's how it's typically explained in Buddhist texts. Right speech, explained in negative terms, means avoiding four types of harmful speech. Lies, words spoken with the intent of misrepresenting the truth. Divisive speech, spoken with the intent of creating rifts between people. Harsh speech, spoken with the intent of hurting another person's feelings. And idle chatter, spoken with no purposeful intent at all. I love that. (laughs) I love that. God knows I participate in idle chatter all the time. Uh, In positive terms, right speech means speaking in ways that are trustworthy, harmonious, comforting, and worth taking to heart. When you make a practice of these positive forms of right speech, your words become gifts to others. In response, other people start listening more to what you have to say and will be more likely to respond in kind. Right speech, compassionate speech is a skill. It takes practice. We all make mistakes all the time. I make mistakes all the time. I have certainly participated in all of those negatives, the lies, the divisive speech, the harsh speech, the idle chatter. I absolutely certainly do that. And I have to keep myself in check. And in keeping myself in check, it means developing this skill, but being mindful of who we want to be and how we want to get there will keep pulling us back to practicing this skill. Now, I'm going to be offering exercises for participants to do at the event, one of which involves practicing giving up gossip. For a day or a week, maybe a day is where to start, commit to not saying anything about other people unless you've already said or would be willing to say this to them directly. Whenever you find yourself tempted to gossip, just try and recognize the underlying motive. It's pretty amazing to be cognizant of what you're tempted to say about people and how you want to talk about them and what your intention is behind it. Try it. No doubt you'll be at least more self-aware than if you didn't practice this exercise. Number four, compassion is innate. Recent studies of compassion argue persuasively that compassion and benevolence are an evolved part of human nature rooted in our brain and biology. That's why I often talk about speaking to the compassion in others because I believe it's inside of everyone, but it might be hidden or asleep. Approaching and perceiving each person we encounter with the awareness that they're a compassionate person will completely alter our interaction with them. Number five, compassion is a decision. However, even though compassion is innate, lurking inside of everyone, it's still something we have to decide to be in our actions, in our thoughts, and in our words. Perhaps the way to look at what it means to live a compassionate life is not only to say, how can I be more compassionate? right? Compassion is absolute. It can't be more or less of itself. This compassion inside of you, it's as perfect as it gets. But we can ask, how can I act more compassionately? Sure, that's a question we can ask. We can ask, how can I speak more compassionately? But maybe another question to add is, how can I not block my compassion? How can I remove the blocks to my compassion? And I often say that that was what becoming vegan was about for me. But asking what blocks our compassion, this unconditional compassion, I think is so helpful because if it's fear or insecurity or eating animals or and their secretions, right, we can address those things. So my compassion's there and it's pretty awesome and it's inside of me, but what am I doing to block it from emerging completely and unconditionally? How are you blocking your compassion is what I would ask you. And I ask myself that probing question as well. (laughs) I'm not only encouraging you to ask it of yourself, I'm asking it of myself as well. Number six, compassion is cultivated. And again, though compassion is already in us, just as there are muscles in us that are hidden or weak or uncultivated or atrophied, we need to exercise them in order to keep them strong. It's the same with compassion. Even though it's in us doesn't mean we don't need to cultivate it. And of course, at the compassion retreat, we're going to be talking about all those ways to cultivate 
compassion. Some of those may be what I've already said, right speech. It could be meditation. It could be mindfulness practice for you. It could be visualization. It could be reflection, breathing exercises, prayer, mantras, acts of kindness, rituals. You pick what resonates with you, but pick. Number seven, compassion is humble. Because we are what I call practicing humans, we all make mistakes. We are imperfect by definition. We shouldn't expect to not make mistakes, but we should expect to atone for them. It's not what happens, it's how we react to what happens. It's never about what happens, it's always about how we respond to it. So we can apologize, we can repent, we can atone, and I talk about this in one of the stages about atonement and repentance. I talked about it when I talked about regret, and I encourage you to go listen to that. But when we do use speech that is, you know, attacking someone or gossiping or even just thinking those thoughts, I mean, we can go back to the person and atone or we can do it within ourselves. We can do it in an appropriate way, uh, in a safe way, but we do need to atone. And of course, there's nothing more humbling than admitting we're wrong and doing something to right it. Number eight, compassion feels good. Compassion makes us feel good. And research is bearing this out all over the place. And I'll be sharing a lot of those uh, at the weekend. But I think knowing this is really helpful because knowing that compassion feels good will help us figure out that if we're doing something that's self-effacing or without a pure motive, like we want something in return rather than out of pure compassion, that means knowing the difference, right? Between whether we're doing something with the right intentions or not. If it doesn't feel good, if it makes us feel anxious or angry or resentful, it's not compassion. Martyrs suffer. Compassionistas rejoice. Compassion feels good. That's number eight. Number nine, compassion is universal. Secular philosophies and religions all around the world for centuries value compassion as a basic tenet of right living. It's the do no harm principle. It's the do unto others as you would have done to you principle. It's so fundamental and it's so universal. This means we can speak the language of compassion to everyone we meet, wherever we are, whatever language we speak, whatever religion or philosophy we practice. Compassion is universal. Number 10, compassion is contagious. We know this anecdotally and research continues to bear this out. It confirms that compassion is contagious. If you want to help spread compassion, lead by example. Because remember, this isn't about simply being vegan. And everyone knows that or they wouldn't get so uptight when we show up as the vegan in the room. When you state, I am vegan, you are not simply saying, I eat vegetables. You are a physical representation of someone who is living a conscious life with an awakened mind and heart. You're authentically manifesting what it means to live healthfully and compassionately. So let's do it. That can rock people's boats when you show up authentic and powerful in your unconditional compassion. So what? There are worse things in the world than operating from our highest selves and manifesting the deepest, most profound, most fierce compassion we have. If that's not appealing to you, then ask yourself, what's the alternative? And how does that sound? How does that feel? For the animals, this is Colleen Patrick-Gaudreau. Thanks for listening. 